Hello, everyone. Welcome to B-Sides Iowa 2018. This is a, a conversation or a um, presentation on device exploitation or post-exploitation, sorry. So we're going to talk about what you can do with the device after you have the shell on it, basically. And um, I really want to make this like interactive. And uh, if you have a question for me, and you ask, and it has to do with this this presentation. Uh, you're gonna get a IoT hacking starter kit from this box. You can choose whichever one you want, or I can just choose one for you, one of the two. So uh, I want to encourage that feedback, those questions. I want to encourage uh, everyone to have fun. I certainly had fun putting this together, and uh, we'll just jump right in. Okay, who am I? Uh, let's see, I am a Des Moines-based security researcher, penetration tester. Uh, by day, open source security researcher. By night, IoT security researcher. So really, this, this IoT stuff is just something I do in my spare time. Um, so uh, that's a little bit about me. If, if you want to know more, come talk to me afterwards. Okay, like I said, this talk is... It is about the once once you have a shell, right? So once you have compromised a device, a device or otherwise have administrative access to it, that's what this this presentation is going to be on. What it's not going to be on is about device exploitation itself. So I'm not going to show you how to gain administrative access. It's just going to be taken as like a prerequisite to the rest of the conversation that you already have a root shell. You already have some way to uh, execute binaries on the system, um, and preferably you have root access. You know, you actually have uh, like system level access. So, just a, a couple of introductions to things. Um, I, I don't know what everyone's like, uh, you know, experience level is. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna start really basic, and uh, get kind of more complicated towards the end. Uh, Internet of Things is basically any sort of device that's not a desktop or a server that can communicate. We're going to be talking about IP devices today. So there's other protocols like Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave. Like there's a lot of different ways for these devices to communicate. So I'm only going to focus on IP devices. And specifically, um, I have a like consumer-grade router from a couple years ago up here. That's what I'm going to demonstrate some of these techniques on. So. We're really going to be talking about like networking gear, IP cameras, DVR, NVRs, those type of like um, uh, devices. Uh, so not like you know your Bluetooth drill or your you know Z-Wave thing that turns your lights on. So uh, just wanted to you know define that so that we know what's kind of in scope for this conversation. Um, so. Why is IoT important? Uh, so just the number of devices alone that are attached to the public internet, um, publicly exposed with an interface on the device mapped to like you know a public IP address is enormous. So um, I don't have numbers with me, but there's probably millions of these things out there, if not like even more than that, like tens of millions or hundreds of millions. There's, there's just tons and tons of these devices connected. Um, and you combine that with how easy it is to exploit these things because um, security considerations were minimal when they were designed. Um, and you get the scenario where like you can get a lot of, you can manipulate a large number of devices concurrently uh, to do things like generate traffic to take down Brian Krebs website. So it's a real kind of like low hanging fruit thing, right? I mean, you know, you have really hardened hosts on the internet. Why attack those when you can like get one that, you know, it requires no authentication to, to you know, get the telnet daemon running or something, and uh, use that to uh, compromise the device. You know, I mean, there's no tr hackers going to take the low-hanging fruit, right? It's, you know, it's it's um, that's why there's so many of these like botnets that have come out recently. Um, and that leads me to Mirai. So uh, Mirai was this enormous botnet that was, was the one that took down uh, Krebs's website and then took down Dyn, uh, the DNS provider. 
uh, it was a big deal when it was for, when it, when it uh, took down Dyn especially, um, and it was composed almost entirely of IoT devices. I mean, there were some C2 servers in there telling the IoT devices what to do, but I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of nodes, the largest botnet ever created at that point. Uh, so that's kind of one of the, 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 one of the two big nefarious ways that these IoT devices can be used in mass, can be used uh, after you have a bunch of them collected and willing to do your bidding. So I don't know anything about Mariah than what I just told you. Uh, I've never examined the source code. I, I, the source code was released on the internet. And uh, it's pretty widely available from what I understand if you know where to look. But I don't know where to look. And I never looked at um, the source code in any detail. And basically all I have is the headlines and the news to go off of. But knowing what I do know, I can offer some educated guesses on how they did what they did. And uh, has anyone in here looked at the Mirai source code? You have, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on whether or not I'm accurate and how they do some of this stuff when we get a little further into the presentation. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, just maybe, maybe afterwards we can catch up or something. Uh, so there's a lot of these botnets out there now. Like, um, I think the last one, uh, they have, like, families now. Like, there's the Mirai family because the, the, um, the source code was leaked and people started modifying it and spinning up their own uh, Mirai botnet clones. Uh, there's a couple other big ones. Like, uh, I don't know how this, there was one that was actually leveraging exploits to compromise devices, and that was like a big, like, quantum leap in, in uh, botnet curation was when they started using, like, really high-end exploits to capture devices. Uh, I don't remember the name of that one, though, um, off the top of my head. And basically what, you want, what, what these bad actors want to do is grab as much, many, many of these devices as possible to maximize the amount of bandwidth that they can send to anywhere, you know, that they can sell off to the highest bidder to, to do things like take down Brian Card's website. So this is kind of where this presentation takes a turn. Like we've seen, every, I'm sure most of you guys are aware of the, uh, the like DDoS implications of IoT and how it can be, you know, leveraged to do bad things. But there's, there's one other really like nefarious track you can go down um, with regard to like compromising an IoT device. So like the, bi the big one for me is complete network traffic surveillance. So if you can like get onto someone's home router and you know what to do with it, you can monitor all their internet traffic, right? I mean, all the traffic goes through the router to get to the rest of the, the, the world. And if they have anything going on interesting on the LAN, you'll be able to see that too because you're between those as well. So that lends itself to things like extortion, uh, man-in-the-middle attacks, DNS poisoning attacks. Like if I have control of this uh, router and you haven't configured your uh, DNS settings on your, on your machine, on, on your desktop, your desktop is going to use the router as a DNS server, which is then going to use whatever DNS server the router is programmed to use as the upstream DNS server. So if I change that upstream DNS server to a server that I control and start directing all of your traffic to my malicious domain whenever you try to make a request to paypal.com, you know, you start seeing some interesting phishing scenarios and interesting uh, credential harvesting scenarios that you can get into and, you know, get bank account information or whatever, you know. I mean, the, the sky's the limit with that sort of thing. So it's a very, very powerful position to be in terms of on a network. You know, we're not talking, these, these sort of devices are not used in really, really sensitive contexts, right? Like no one's running a data center off of a home, home router, right? I mean, they're really, they're really only used in like um, home and small office contexts most of the time. So like, you're, you're basically attacking an individual, but if you can automate all of it, then you can attack individuals in mass to perform this kind of like network traffic surveillance and do these sort of nefarious things. And I haven't really seen any botnets doing that sort of thing. Um, I haven't heard about it. I have, I, all I've really heard about is uh, IoT botnets that are generating traffic for the malicious botnet bad actors. 
So there's like a whole new evolution, I think, that's going to happen eventually when, they, when, when attackers start realizing like how they can leverage this really powerful position on the network to make more money, basically, you know, to scam more people, harvest more credentials. Um, I, I think we're going to see another wave of IoT botnet malware that's going to do some very nasty things. Uh, so that's that's kind of what I want to focus on for this presentation is that is that angle to it. Like, you know, I can get on here and I can make web requests really easily. It's not that difficult, you know, and that's that's one of the ways they generate level seven traffic that can bypass all the DDoS filters uh, on its way to. Brian Krebs' website. So that's not a big deal. What, what I think is the big deal is what I just said, the, the complete network traffic surveillance. Um, however, like I said, no one's really doing this yet because it's pretty difficult to do. Um, so, so basically to have any of these capabilities, you're going to have to be able to compile binaries that will run on a device like this. So that's possible, uh, but it's, it's pretty difficult to do. Uh, so when you get one of these devices, it comes with firmware pre-installed on it, right? And you can many times update that firmware with another manufacturer of firmware or like an open source firmware. The, the, in this particular example, we're going to focus on manufacturer firmware, but... Um, when you flash the device with that firmware, you have a certain set of binaries that are pre-installed that come with, you know, Linux and um, that you can have, you can access when, and run once you have shell access on the device. So really what we want to do is expand our binary base. We want to we expand our capabilities on the device beyond what's provided by the, uh, the manufacturer. So uh, I'm going to walk you through kind of my process on what I do once I have a shell on a device. Uh, the first thing is enumeration. Uh, I start with enumerating the binaries on the device. Uh, there's other things you can do, like checking the mount structure, seeing wh what file systems are mounted, um, which ones are read-only, which ones are read-write, uh, which ones are persistent, which ones are not. Uh, you also probably want to see what file systems are available in the kernel in case you need to mount an NFS server or something to get files on and off. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of little things to do, but like the big one is, um, is, is, is finding all the binaries on the device. What's up? So when, when you're doing this, are you, um, are, are you just kind of doing this like all through the command line, or are you doing something like dump the firmware and then use binwalk to like try to enumerate binaries, or are you? Yeah, so I do both of those things. Oh, okay. And I'll show you a little bit of the second one, the, the binwalk stuff, um, in my live demo, but I'm not gonna focus too much on that today. It's a really effective way of getting information about firmware, but, um, okay. you know, I, I... I'm just kind of curious, like, how, uh, when you're enumerating, are you just kind of, like, is that a systematic thing, or are you just kind of, like, wandering around just poking your nose? Well, at this directory. <laughs> at, yeah, I mean, I do both of those things. Okay. I, I do, um, you know, I, I do the, the file system availability in the kernel, the mounting structure, the uh, binary available listing, and then, like, a, if they have find on there, I'll run find against the entire root structure and then, like, dump it to a file somewhere so I can review it later. So, so do you also, like, look at, like, the NVRAM, like, where they store, like, the yeah. user credentials for, like, yeah. the DSL network? Yeah. Because, like... Some of the things I could worry about is like, you know, a lot of times your ISP will like set you up with a webmail account that uses the same credentials on your DSL modem, and then the bad guy can go, you know, essentially go log into that account for you. Yeah. If you've never, because a lot of people don't know that they've got a webmail account, and then they can have a whole other identity that's piggybacking off the user. So that's really interesting. I try. I was looking at how to browse the NVRAM on. Um, this device in particular, I couldn't find it. And with the limited amount of time I had, I could not find the binary which did that. So in other instances, you just run nvram show and then grip pipe it to grep, and then you can see like the user, the usernames, the pa If you grep for pass, you can see the passwords of, you know, the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi access point, all kinds of stuff. Like, and and that's another useful component to the data you can harvest from from having that, you know, privileged position on the network. 
you know, you could if, if you were really looking to target a specific individual, you could get like the Wi-Fi um, password or public private uh, public share key, and you know, drive by their house, log on their network, and then you have a full full node like a Kali instance on their network. It, it just requires physical proximity at that point. Uh, okay, let's go on to the next slide. I, any other questions? By the way, you guys get to pick one out. Give him the advanced thing. Okay. I'll take the starter. <laughs> what, do you, what do you recommend? This one, for sure. All right. That's like Socrates' first. Oh, uh, Clubris. I love Clubris. Yeah, I mean, that, that works too. And I cleaned, I cleaned all this stuff up before I gave it to you. I reset it. That's an easy one. <laughs> that one. All right. Okay. So, sorry it's old, but, That's cool. you know, um, the, the old stuff's the most fun anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. The question was, uh, what, what's actually on the device in terms of available binaries? Uh, I will show you during my, my live thing, but also it's just the basic Linux like utilities like LS, CAT. Um, you know, like sometimes wget will be on there, sometimes curl will be on there, sometimes neither, sometimes it's like FTP, sometimes it's um, TFTP. I mean, there's, there's almost always some way of making network traffic, but like in terms of transferring things on and off the device, it's, it gets difficult if you don't have curl or wget. You have to set up a TFTP server almost always and transfer things that way. Um, there's also all kinds of firmware updating capabilities. There's... Um, there, there's other like there's like the HTTP daemons on there usually. So there, there's a couple different things, you know. Um, and I'll show I'll show you more in detail when I go through the live presentation. So, like I said, you really want to look for uh, binaries that can um, create network traffic. One because that's the first goal, right? To create network traffic to hit a, a big target. But second of all, you want to be able to transfer things on and off the device. So um, one of the ways that I, one of the first things I did when I was trying to compile binaries for this device was um, pull a file off of it and run the file command on that file, on that binary. Like I pulled the httpd file off there, which is the http daemon that uh, runs the server on port 80. So I pull that off there and I run file on it. And you know, later on, I'll run it through Binary Ninja and take a deeper look at it, looking for other interesting things. But the file command alone, like, tells me so much that um, I was able to really kind of troubleshoot some of my compilation issues uh, by by just knowing what kind of architecture and what kind of you know binaries are, are on the device itself, uh, you know, by default. Um, so yeah, anything that's, anything that's going to create network traffic is interesting. Uh, if you want to be really destructive, the firmware update capabilities are pretty interesting too. You can do some bad things with those. Um, do you typically find uh, GCC compiled for that architecture? No, not on the device, never. Never once have I seen GCC, um, G++, CC, uh, GDB, GDB, LLVM, uh, GDB server, none of that stuff is ever on these things by default. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a great question though, because that would make things easy, right? Yeah. Well, it turns out those, the, the, those binaries to do, like you were talking about, like GCC, are available just not on the device. So uh, we'll go over that in a minute. Uh, let's see here. So like like the the malware that I the Mirai botnet for example, like um, I assume the payload the initial like exploit payload that was written to the file system was just a shell script. I, I don't know that. Like obviously I said I haven't looked at the um, I haven't looked at the source or anything, but I imagine it given the given the difficulty in compiling almost anything for these devices and especially how they won't they. Based, because of the glibc version, how you can't really port, um, you know, a binary compiler for this to another device by another manufacturer, like the the, the amount of trouble there leads me to, to speculate that they use shell scripts 
to, um, to you know, contact the C2 server and figure out what to run. Uh, and that's malware, you know, that's, that's, that's not legitimate software. Uh, I, I wrote this up um, at a earlier point in time um, to demonstrate how I think uh, this could work as a shell script. Like, I mean, you just, if you have, for example, wget, which this device has, you make a wget request, store it in an environment variable, and then loop, you know, 1,000, 10,000, 500, in number of times executing that command that you retrieve from the C2 server, um, you know, and that, that command's going to look like wget http briankrebs.com or krebsonsecurity.com, you know, so... The, the C2 server is going to control like what gets attacked or what happens there, um, you know, what command gets run on the device. And then, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to create all that back traffic to your, your, um, your C2 server. So like when you're done attacking, you change that payload.txt to like echo one or something so that, you know, the, uh, the shell script, the, the malware is not, uh, doing anything malicious and because, you know, if your customer's not paying, you don't want to be delivering product for them. Okay, yeah, so this is uh, the meme break. break. Uh, I thought that was funny. No one's laughing right now, but I thought it was good. Uh, so next slide. So now I really want to get into, like, what I call the path to compilation and just talk through the difficulties and the challenges I experienced uh, trying to get something to run on uh, this, this device and then trying to get something complex to run on this device. Turns out there's like an order of magnitude difficulty between just those two things, let alone the easy stuff. Um, so processors, right? Uh, I've looked at a lot of IoT devices. The newer ones all seem to be ARM-based. Uh, a lot of the older, almost all of the older ones are Lexra or MIPS. And uh, this one is a Lexra uh, processor. And what Lexra is, is that it's a subset of MIPS without the uh, unaligned load and store commands, so, or uh, opcodes. So, if you compile a MIPS binary, it, it's likely to have those opcodes in it. Well, if it has those opcodes in it, it won't run because this processor does not accept those opcodes. And I'll show you that in a minute, but it's, that's a really important note. That's like the crux of this whole problem. If it was just the MIPS, like the standard MIPS opcode set, you can compile this using the GNU tool chain, you know, the cross compiler that you can get off Aptitude or uh, Fedora or EPL and just compile right there and you know you're done you don't have any additional work to do um, in, in that case I would think there would be a lot more bad malware out there because I think it'd be really easy to compile binaries that do horrible things that get on these devices uh, so more difficulties with the Lexer processor the Linux kernel the main source tree does not support compiling the Lexera. so if you want to compile a version of the of the Linux kernel that is devoid of those unaligned store and load commands, you have to use these uh, these, these patches that uh, this guy on this website provides and uh, run them against your Linux kernel and then send it out on millions of devices. That's, that's literally some guy on the internet. So does that mean that every one of these devices that runs Disneybox has this set of patches in it? It's very, very likely. If not, they're going to have patches that are internally developed. Uh, but I, I, that's a lot of work. And from what I've seen, people don't put a lot of work into these things. So I'm guessing a lot of them, uh, you know, so just use some guy on the internet's patches. So if you find an exploit in one of those patches, you have a kernel exploit. You might do the whole time. Well, you th I mean, yes and no. That sounds awesome, but you know what? If you get a show on these, it's a root show anyway. So there's no like need for privilege escalation or anything. <laughs> but it's a good point. I mean, there's there's other things you could find using that methodology that would that would lead to interesting uh, results, I think. Do you want an IoT starter kit? Sure, maybe later, sure, maybe later? that's a no. <laughs> okay. I'm just too lazy to walk over there. Okay, I'll, I'll, I, we know each other. I'll, I'll get you afterwards. 
So, okay, I, like I mentioned before, no, no GCC, no, co no compilation tools on the device itself. However, most of those tool chains, and in fact, the Linux kernel itself is licensed under the GPL license, you know? So part of the GPL license, as I understand it, is you have to provide the source code. And uh, like if anyone who gets, if you use a GPL in your product, you have to provide the source code for free to all your end users. So the way that um, manufacturers typically handle this is by making available on the internet, on, their, on the manufacturer website, what's called GPL code. And that's like usually, let's see. That's like, you know, the Linux kernel itself is almost always, is always in there, you know, it's some version of it at least. Um, so that's, that's the big one. But then additionally, a lot of these manufacturers put the, the tool chain that you need to use to compile these binaries in that code. Uh, so that's how you get a, that's how you get a compiler for these devices. Now, once you have a compiler for them, um, um, we'll go over this in a minute. Uh, once you have a compiler form, though, like that, that gets you the first step, the easy, the easy binaries, right? The, like the hello world binaries that are, you know, a, a demonstration of a concept, but are, are, you know, a hair shy of a real, uh, capability for, for lack of a better phrase. So, uh, af after, after I got to the point of being able to compile these binaries, and ta it takes a while. You have to find the exact GPL code for the exact device, the exact version of the firmware, and uh, know where to look within that 500 or 600 megabyte file, um, you know, zip archive you download, for where to find all the stuff and things to compile um, your own binaries, you know, where the, where the GCC and the G++ exist. And once, once you get those in a place where you can use them effectively, like, there's a lot of make file manipulation, a lot of, like, autoconf stuff that you have to set exactly the right parameters to it. You have to um, go into the make files it generates and monkey around with those so that they, they include the proper header files, not, not the, uh, the, like, host operating systems uh, header files. So that part was the most complicated because like at that point you're in uncharted territory. Like no, no one has a stack overflow post on how to modify a make file to config, to compile curl on a lecture processor. In fact, there's almost nothing on the internet about lecture processors in, in general. Um, you, you know, the, it, there's just very little information at this point. And it's like, for me, it was like walking through a dark room, trying to find the light switch so that you can find the door to the next dark room to find the next light switch. Um, it was an interesting process, but difficult and frustrating. So uh, we're getting kind of close to the point where I want to demonstrate some stuff. So I want to say this first. Um, I am today going to demo on this, like, this device, right? And... I don't want to like single out this manufacturer as being better or worse than any other manufacturer. It was just an easy demonstration device. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers, all of them have, all of them have their own problems, right? So I don't want to be up here like bashing on one particular manufacturer because I, I don't feel like that's helpful and I don't feel like that's even accurate, you know. So, and, and, and software in general is hard. Embedded software additionally is super hard to do. So I, I don't even want to fault the people for these issues, you know. They're getting better at remediating them once they're reported, but um, I don't like bashing on software developers. Uh, I just feel like software is hard. So I want to make that point at least, that I'm not, I'm not trying to single out this particular manufacturer. I'm not, I'm not going to like actually tell you what it is, but you'll be able to tell by, by when I start doing the things and the stuff on the terminal. So I just want to make that point. Uh, the GPL code that comes for that comes off the website for this device has this readme.txt file in it, and uh, it's, it's there's a little more to it than this, but like really this is the bulk of the instructions on how to compile your own kernel that'll and uh, and binaries and programs that'll run on this device. So 
the uh, one of the interesting things, I think this is interesting, under three, building the image, uh, it says make three times in a row. You actually have to run make three times in a row in the same directory to get it to, to do its thing. Um, which I, I, I didn't know at first. I thought it was like a typo. Like they, they had make, 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 and I was like, okay, I run make once, and it didn't do the things. So I, I had to run it three times. Um, it's not very effective. <laughs> Uh, the, the one of the, the the really big thing here is the the copy dash rf rsdk that contains all the compilation tool chains and all the assets and, and, and header files you'll need to compile your own kernel to compile your own binaries and uh, it's it's a it's a proprietary SDK provided by um, a, a, a giant board manufacturer. Okay, so let's do some presentation time. Okay, so let's, let's get on to the device. Okay, got to do something first. Sorry, guys. Got it. Let's get to this. Sorry for the delay. It'll just take a second. become reachable. This is fun. This is the fun you have when you do live demos. So you have to run make three times. You have to run Calnet, I think like 25. <laughs> <laughs> what is the deal? Was it three seconds or 20 seconds? About, uh, yeah. There we go. All right. So the first thing I want to show you on this uh, we're not logged in yet, right? So what if I type in like a random username? What would you expect to happen next? Password for anyway. Yeah, it's for the password anyway. Not a valid username. So this allows you to figure out what the username is. Okay, so now we're on the device. We have, a, we have our root shell that it's so kindly returned to us um, without any other like sub privileges. So I'll go through my enumeration and then I'll like start doing the fun stuff. So like, you know, you echo out the path. You see this list of binaries. Is this big enough for everyone to see by the way? Okay, cool. Um, so uh, you see some fun stuff in here. You see like wget, and you see um, all the all the uh, de facto Linux commands like uname, umount, um, all you know, just random different things. Uh, so you, the next thing I would do is check the mounted file systems. It looks like uh, the var slash var slash sys. Uh, slash dev and slash temp, which is a symlink to dash var, are read writable. Um, okay, and it's seen, and everything else at the root is read only. Okay, that's, that makes sense. Something else I would do is like cat proc CPU info, and this is basic, you know, enumeration stuff. This isn't anything fancy. Uh, Uh, these are the file systems that are available. You can see NFS is available. 
Um, sometimes you can actually mount an NFS server on these things to, you know, take files off of them. Sometimes, like, it doesn't work quite great, but um, I've definitely seen that and done that and uh, had some good fun there. Uh, let's see. That's, that's the file, the binaries, file systems, and the mount structure. So we have what we need now to go and have some fun. So I'm in the I'm in the temp directory right now. We're gonna start up a web server over here on my host operating system. And we're gonna use wget to pull curl over. Okay, now we should have curl on here. Got to change the execution permit privilege on the binary. Now, now what should happen is I should be able to run this binary against this web server that's running over here um, that, that I just used the pull curl with. Um, we can actually just do the index. That would be a bit good. So we get the stuff in the things. And you can see over on the right hand side, it made the request. Now, curl does not come on this device by default. I, I transcompiled curl to be able to run it on this device. So uh, that's pretty cool, right? No, this device already had wget on it. It's not cool at all. It's really, really, really <laughs> stupid. So we want to um, maybe do something a little more risque, like uh, pull over nmap. So at this point now I'm an attacker on your router that has nmap on your router. Uh, that can be used just, uh, first of all, I got a point on now. This is nmap 7.7 .7 was released like, 7.7.0 .7 was released like a month ago. This is running nmap 4.53. It's an ancient version of nmap. But it still does all the stuff and the things that we needed to do. Oops. Of course, I don't have any of this in my path. So I can now port scan your network from the router. And if that, if that doesn't seem like a big deal, like if you have anything on your home network, I mean, you can find a way to get to it now. I mean, and you can find other things all kinds of stuff just by doing port scanning and seeing what else is accessible behind the firewall. Uh, this is, th now, when I say is this cool, this is cool. This is, a, this is a new capability that did not exist before on this device that we have added to it uh, by using this very convoluted complex tool chain uh, that we got off the internet. So uh, that's pretty, pretty cool. I mean, I, I think that's better than curl because wget already existed. So let's take it up to like 11 now. Let's take over, where is it? TCP dump. So uh, now if I run What now? Ah, yes, thank you very much. I was getting ahead of myself. Thank you very much, Andy. Oh, hey, there's some DNS traffic coming over your network. Uh, now, this is super cool because now, now I can see all your network traffic. So if I um, come over here to my browser and hit up the uh, 
web interface for for the router I mean all the traffic is like you can see port 80 there it's dumping all the traffic so um, this doesn't really represent the the actual you know uh, TCP body of the request of the HTTP traffic, but you can dump all that out really easily. Um, you can dump it out to a file on the file system and come and get it every once in a while. Uh, you can use netcat and pipe this output there and send it to a remote server that way. Uh, there's a lot of way to get this very, very sensitive data off this device and somewhere else. So uh, this is very cool from a technical perspective, but from a perspective of a victim, this is like the worst thing you could possibly think of on your home router. It's someone who has installed a TCP dump compiled for your Lexra processor uh, monitoring, monitoring your traffic. You know, a bad actor doing that. That's like the worst thing ever. Um, so that's basically my live demonstration. I'm going to go ahead and, yeah, you can see some of like the Apple iPhone traffic because I think my, uh, my phone is connected to that network. Uh, so I'm gonna, oh, yeah, I'm gonna kill that web server. We'll let the other one run. But I wanted to briefly talk about like next steps here. So uh, the limitation on this is that like if the device is rebooted or it otherwise loses power or whatever, you know, um, you'll lose like all your binaries on here. Like you saw when I booted this up and started doing uh, the Telnet session, none of these binaries existed. And I, I've been moving them over all day, you know. Just every time this thing powers down, everything in the temp directory goes away, obviously. Um, and since the temp directory is really the only writable spot, um, that's where they have to go. So a next step in this research, which I, which I looked at uh, very briefly, was that um, compi you can compile your own firmware with a GPL code. Compile your own firmware and package it with uh, TCP dump already built into it. And then flash it on the device. Now, I couldn't, for the practical reason why I couldn't do that was um, I've tried messing around with flashing devices before, and uh, sometimes the device gets bricked. Didn't want to brick this guy right before my big presentation, so um, I wasn't able to like, start messing around with that. Uh, but I think that's the, the logical endpoint for this, is having your own firmware you can compile using the manufactured GPL code and uh, you know, get it somehow maliciously onto someone's home router. Uh, that's all I've got today. I know I've gone pretty close to the time. Does anyone have any questions? You don't actually need the Linux source for I mean, like the open source for this. I mean, can't you just take like user lib, send it back to the, uh, the compiler and say, oh, by the way, here's my standard libraries with all the way that I have it configured. Here's my headers for my version of the operating system. Compile that and you know my processor type, so you know, use that byte order. And then you don't need any of the source code. Oh, no. You, I mean, yeah, you're right. You, all you need is the binaries that can compile them, right? Like GCC. Yeah, yeah but you don't need like their GPL disclosure stuff because you have user lib on there. With yes, but the tool chain is additionally included in the GPL stuff. And that, that's what I didn't have. The what? The, the GPL, uh, uh, the, the tool chain. Like oh, the, the tool chain for the specific process. Yes. Okay. And that's what, that can, for some reason, that's included with the GPL code for this device. And that's why that's how I got this tool chain is from the manufacturer themselves. Um, but you're right; you don't need the Linux kernel at all. Well, you uh, the, need to know what the operating system call codes are. Yeah, um, and, but the advantage of having all the kernel source code and all that stuff is if you wanted to compile your own firmware and, and bundle that up, and all of the tools to do all those things are in that GPL package. So um, that's where you would want to have the, the kernel source code and all that stuff. You're gonna have to. Start selling on eBay real cheap. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's not that's not good. <laughs> How did you get the Telnet password for this one? That you know? There we go. That's that's where I was going to talk about the uh, Benoit. Um, I extract. I downloaded the firmware okay. for the device. Uh, I extracted it using Benoit e and. Uh, yeah, they, well, I didn't even have to do that. It was all PHP files. So I just, like, I knew exactly where it was, and I just went in and found it, you know, and got it. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's, I meant to go into that more, but, you know, that's a good question. Do you want another one? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? If you would like to get started on IoT hacking, you can come up and get a kit.
for free. You can have one. Yeah, and I encourage you, if you find something cool, come and present on it next year. You know, uh, that would be awesome. That would be an awesome thing to see is just, you know, the community doing this stuff. And there's still some cool stuff in here. Like, there's some crappy stuff in here, too. But there's some cool stuff in here still. So, okay, I'm going to recommend two of you. This one will be a good one, and this one will be a good one. Uh, it's not the latest one, but uh, th and this one's pretty old. This one's probably the newest thing I have. That'll be fun to play with. All right. Thank you.